So the way this is going to work is we have five panels. I'll introduce them in a second. We're going to record the panel discussion up until the close of the hour, so in 50 minutes from now. And then we're going to stop the recording and continue for anyone else who wants to continue the discussion. Uh, the panelists are not required to stay past the hour. I only made them promise to stay until three. So, so that's the way it's going to work. Let me just briefly introduce our five panelists. There's Igor Mazin, who's a theorist from Georgia, uh, sorry, from George Mason University. He wrote a very nice uh, recent commentary on the inverse Rock Occam's razor effect, which is how in our field we have a tendency to promote and publish fantastical explanations rather than uh, simple ones. Um, there's Lawrence Mullenkamp from the University of Würzburg. Um, he runs a lab that's broadly interested in electron transport. Uh, he was editor at Physical Review B for about a decade, and I'm sure he's seen many retracted results um, over the course of his tenure. He was also recently involved in presenting evidence against that chiral Majorana paper that we just heard about that was retracted. Uh, David Muller is another person on our panel. He's a Cornell. He's an experimentalist whose group is broadly interested in materials physics. Uh, he was involved in pointing out misrepresentations in data from at least one nature paper that I know of. Um, and he also contributed to the investigation of Jan Hendrik Schoen and that, that, that Farabell Labs. We have Eugenie Reich in the audience. Uh, she's attorney at the law firm of Pollock Cohen, where she represents whistleblowers in cases of scientific and pharmaceutical fraud. She's probably best known to many people in the audience as the author of the book Plastic Fantastic, which is the definitive account of the Jan Hendrik Schoen scandal. Um, and we have Jessica Thomas, who's the executive editor, editor at Physical Review. She's been an editor at Physical Review since 2008, has been the executive editor since 2020. So my idea was to kick off the panel by making sure every all the panelists get a chance to speak by just directing questions to them one at a time, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience and panelists can argue with each other. But I want to at least make sure that to start, everyone gets a chance to talk and <laughs> introduce themselves to the audience. So Igor, we're going in alphabetical order. That means we start with you. Um, and uh, Condensed matter physics is different than psychology in a lot of the science fields in that we have a prominent you know, population of theorists and a lot of our work is theoretical. And I kind of want to talk about to what degree theorists are involved or are culpable when we have replication issues. So what degree do you, to what degree do you see theorists as being culpable in driving sort of trendy narratives? And do you view it as an ethical problem when theorists are sort of promoting an unreliable experiment as a confirmation of some theory that they like? Okay, start with that. Take it for a few minutes as long as you want. Okay. All right. So first of all, uh, I think as actually our first speaker alluded to, a uh, large uh, part of our problem is a human psychology, which is the same no matter whatever you are doing. I don't know, digging holes or doing physics. Uh, you always strive for success and uh, sometimes sacrifice, try to uh, to cut corners, you know, like uh, taking a metro uh, at marathon run, uh, you know, the story. Um, all right. So now, so this, I don't think, I don't know about other fields, but I don't see why physics should be less or more prone, except that there might be fields like maybe pharmaceutical science, where just monetary rewards are much bigger and Consequently, uh, temptations are bigger. Um, so this uh, said, the theory and experiment are not that much different. Particularly, uh, this my if I I posted something in the chat on that. I think it's in many 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 cases that I'm personally familiar with um, the what we called fraud or manipulations doesn't really start as a fraudulent activity. Let me try to uh, fraud uh, my colleagues out of um, spite or something uh, or greed. Mm, it starts with somebody honestly believing that that's what they should see or that what they should uh, calculate uh, or that's what they see or issue. It could be experiment that really wants to reproduce a very fancy theory. It could be a theory which wants to explain an enigmatic experiment. And at some point, uh, many of us are familiar with this feeling. You feel like, well, sure, I know that it should be this or that. And if I'm not getting that answer right, I might have a sign error somewhere. So why don't I just correct the science? <laughs> correct the sign error. That actually happened to me once. And the paper was accepted and was nearly published. And fortunately, before it was actually published, the columnist said, you know, I was trying to reproduce your result, but I don't think the science is right uh, uh, here. But I said, well, but then 
we all understand intuitively what the short answer should be, it would be not, well, maybe we don't understand it properly. And then we went through that once again, and I took this paper out, circulation, and then we rewrote it uh, together. And I know other examples, again, uh, a colleague of mine, he was presenting a talk at the APS March meeting. Um, at the talk, another colleague stood up and basically pointed out a uh, very distinct and obvious error in what he was doing. There's no question this is an error. And after that, I, I came up to him and said, uh, well, uh, what are you going to do about that? That nothing, the paper has been accepted PRL. I'm not going to throw out a PRL because somebody found the mistake. So uh, now the, again, so this is something which is common and we are trying to fight it. Now there is a very few um, subset uh, a few people, and mostly they are known in the uh, physics society, who are actually actively pushing things. Again, another person I know, experimentalist at a very, very high rank institution, very famous, um, a young theorist, he was experimentalist, working with him, said he not, never ever I'm going to work with this person, because he basically comes to me and says, you know, your calculations have to give me this and that. And just no way how you um, how that can be wrong. And that person actually eventually published a paper uh, where they wanted to support the interpretation experiment with some band structure calculations, which did not support the theory. So what they did, they just shifted by hand the Fermi energy in their bands by half a volt, without ever mentioning or explaining that. So I don't know what you would call it, a theory or experiment. I know that the both were experimentalists. I know that the person who did calculations was a uh, postdoc, um, fully dependent on the boss. And the boss said, I know that it should be this way. So if you had not giving me that, your calculations are wrong. So eventually he just manipulated his, but he was forced into that. Um, so what can, what else can be added? Uh, well, one thing then, then after that, um, several people did correct calculations none of them was able to publish uh, their result in a journal like Nature. And uh, in, in, in some cases, the answer was just um, as explicit. Well, yes, we agree that this is, uh, that you found an error, but that doesn't make your paper uh, strong enough for Nature or Nature Communications or even PRX or PRL. It's not that interesting. So I think that the last part is the biggest problem, whether it's zero or experiment. Okay, thank you, thank you. Let's move on to our next panelist, if you don't mind. This is a question for Professor Mullenkamp. I think a lot of us are worried about the question of whether things are getting worse. You know, maybe things are bad, but are they worse than they used to? So I wonder if you can give us any perspective about whether you feel like over the last 20 years any or so, anything has changed about the way non-producible result, non-reproducible results are spread or they're publicized or are they falsified more quickly or slowly or do you see a trend in time? I think I do see a trend. Um, but of course I cannot be totally sure because I already started out in condensed matter physics like 30 years ago. Um, and I don't know whether I really had an accurate view of what condensed matter physics was then, but at least it was a smaller crowd. And you only published in Fisher B or Fisher Letter. Uh, and only feels it better if you have something really, really big. And for the rest, you knew each other and you trusted each other. That, that was the community I knew. I don't know whether that was correct, but that's how I looked at it at the time, coming in from chemistry. So it was a bit different. Um, yeah, so at that time, I, I really was uh, impressed by the very uh, concise way that I got told how to write my papers. Don't quote too many other stuff, just the relevant papers, not too much. Not just all your friends, not just all your own papers. And, and uh, when publishing data, this was transport physics, they told me only publish your raw data, nothing else. And that's something that kept with me uh, forever because that was a very worthwhile advice. And what you've seen uh, today in a couple of illustrations already is that nobody publishes raw data anymore. And, and we spent our time trying to figure out how people manipulated it. And that's not a good thing. So when did it change? Well, I think it started changing late 90s. Uh, Neoliberalism government, uh, bureaucracy changing, wanting to have numbers in making their decisions. Uh, so before that, uh, 
in, in judging quality of science, they actually rely on reliable sciences they trusted, but that wasn't good enough. Uh, they wanted numbers, real numbers. And one number was given to them by Jorge is also here at the use index. Well, that, that was a reasonable number. People could more or less live with it, but, but how to compare it between fields already became very difficult. It was very, it was clear very soon. And then the other thing that, that happened is that um, the government institutions that gave you your funding started looking at, 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 at where you published. Uh, and had the impact index of the journals all of a sudden became really important. And at the same time, uh, Nature had a clever uh, editor who actually thought that, that one could, could have built a good business on the impact index of a journal like Nature, because in Nature, it's not just physicists who publish uh, and don't quote each other at all. No, there's also biologists and there's medicine people, and they always have tons of reference lists. So that's why the impact of nature is, is, is enormous compared to the piece of letters where physicists publish their, their big stuff. And yeah, you start trying that, and lo and behold, you get in. And yes, the money comes. I mean, I've been there myself. I'm still going there because this is this is nice. Yeah, you get probably you get publicity, you get journalists phoning in, and of course your next uh, funding comes in way easier. Uh, and that that's what got it moving. Um, and what I throw is also that well, our field is getting more and more sexy for uh, these dodgy journals. Uh, other parts in physics are not uh, as sexy. Uh, and that's why Converse Matter Physics is, is, is really in this, in this whole uh, business of, of, of uh, mass publication and uh, having fancy um, uh, papers way more than other parts of physics. And it's a bit, well, I see my old uh, APS colleagues there. It's a bit of a shame that APS didn't recognize that Converse Matter Physics needs a different treatment than other parts of physics simply because we are so exposed and to this, 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 this lofty paper issue thing. Now, <clears throat> so this is how this got started. And I, I think it's been on a gliding scale. And the part is that, that uh, if you want to publish any glossies, it's all fine, but you, the glossies only want very short uh, papers. So what you do is you publish uh, two or three figures, select it carefully from your data, and the rest of the interesting stuff, you dump in a, um, supplementary material that nobody ever looks at. I mean, this is also something that's been very, very bad for the quality of reporting experimental research. Uh, yes, we all want all the data, but dumping them somewhere where it's not really being properly reviewed and where people hardly can look uh, is, is a very bad idea. And what we see now is that experiments, when they got, uh, got more and more complicated, uh, there's more and more data coming on, and people simply don't allow access anymore to a lot of the uh, data that have been taken. So yes, this is a uh, consequence of the fact that we really want to write very short papers and produce more and more data, actually. And it's very hard to keep track of all the data that you produce, to be honest. And it, it, even if you don't mind people, other people looking at it, you really need a system to, to store these data systematically so that they can be looked at. So <clears throat> yes, things uh, haven't gotten worse and I haven't seen any uh, initiative uh, from these glossies. I mean, they, they are trying to be uh, but but I am not impressed by by the kind of thing that have been going on with, 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 with uh, refereeing issues, making referee names notable. I also think we really need to make sure that we keep our own journals going where we have referees that we can trust. And that's something that, that is not really uh, going in the right direction for commerce matter physics, in my opinion. Something else that, that actually is also not going <clears throat> the way it should be going, uh, as, as Brian indicated, I recently was involved in, uh, in one of his Mariana issues, a uh, paper in science that was completely fake. Um, I was very, very unimpressed with the way that the institutions reacted, not science. Science reacted actually quite well, 
Well, they couldn't do a, a recall because I was after three months, but in the end, they, so they allowed us to publish a paper saying that we couldn't re reproduce these results. And even later on, they were uh, indeed willing to retract that paper based on the information I gave them. But what I really was shocked about was the reaction of the universities that, where these, where these uh, publications really went off. I went to them, gave them all the information I had, the information that was enough for science to withdraw the paper eventually, and they just told me to go home, be a good boy. They didn't think this was interesting. So it's it's not just the journals, it's 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 also very much institutions that don't want to see that their prime researchers are people that are actually uh, defrauding. That defrauding the taxpayer that gives them the funding for these nice institutes that these universities want to have. Yeah, so things have gone massively wrong, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, of course, we can still continue doing things. But for now, if I look at the field where I'm active in spintronics and in topological materials, there is tons of incorrect papers in the literature. And nobody really cares. Well, what would you care? People make claims, whatever. Uh, you just do the things you want to do yourself. And every now and then, if things get really bad, you get into it. And that's what I've done now recently, but I know a lot, a lot more paper that are simply incorrect than are out there. And that's not a good situation to have. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your perspective. Uh, David, I have a question for you next. Actually, I had some other question I was going to ask you, but there's one that came to mind as more interesting. For those of us who study like properties of materials, there's always this issue where someone who's growing a material will grow many samples and then they'll pick their best sample and present that one because there are many things that can go wrong when you're growing a material. To what degree do you feel like there's something dangerous or that can or dishonest that can be done here? Like sort of like what Vincent was alluding to that you make many nanowires and you pick the one that shows that you want. Do you feel like there's an ethical issue there or something that could be a best practice? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I should. I should say um, hi to Don Munro, who was on the um, the shown uh, panel at Bell, and uh, you know I see several Bell Labs colleagues here. Um, you know we had a lot of lunch discussions with Shown, um, and in fact, when I think of some of my in interactions with Hendrik Shown and and some of his collaborators, there was an issue of you know they would he had a collaborator who had made you know a hundred devices and was looking to reproduce Schoen's effect internally. And they, um, you know, they made a hundred of these things and in one or two of them, there was something that maybe looked like something had happened. And in the other 99, nothing had ha happened. And uh, the, this, this person was like, you know, latched on to just the one or two that worked, neglected to mention the other 99 that had failed. Um, and then, you know, when we actually asked to look at one of these things, I just brought it into the lab, I looked at it on an optical microscope, and I watched the device actually peel off the substrate as we looked at it. So it was pretty clear it, it couldn't possibly have happened. And we're like, what the hell are you thinking? Um, this is clearly pathological nuts. But, you know, this was someone who was trying to reproduce desperately internally um, something that... Um, you know, shown had allegedly done, although, you know, as Don will tell you, we had a lot of, a lot of concerns about that. Um, but, you know, again, you know, trying to get a result to work and cherry picking. Um, by time it comes to someone with an electron microscope, um, there's certainly a responsibility of your characterization people to make sure that you don't cherry pick your data. And I do have colleagues in the field who will show you an image you know, that's about three atoms across and claim to have a perfect interface. And um, there's a colleague, um, you know, who produced some weird stuff a couple of years ago. And I, you know, my students start talking to their student at the research conference. And their student sort of, you know, said to mine, it took me a week to find a typical, typical particle. And, and, and that was basically the you know, bad training from the professor that almost a pat when I look at a lot of the misconduct cases that we've seen, um, in many cases, you know, the person who did the bad stuff was a postdoc. Um, but when you kind of look at 
the, uh, their advisors, in many cases, that advisors had more than one person who's done bad things. And part of the problem, you know, there was a microscopy case at a national lab where the advisor, I can point out several of his postdocs who did really bad things. And the, the, you know, the blame I lay on the advisor is his view of the science at the most general level was, you know, would order the postdoc to get the result he knew that he thought should be the right result. So in many cases, these were people who set out to prove something rather than setting out to disprove something. And that's a hell of a difference in how you behave and what you get pressured into after that. To even the point at one, one of their papers when I asked the person who had been caught faking data with beautiful duplicate curves that were mirrored and dodgy stuff like that. And what they, what they said was, oh, my boss told me to produce a figure to convince the reviewer of what our data would have looked like if we had measured it. And we just forgot to mention that in the figure caption. The particular curve in question had error bars on it. Um, so, so sorry, if you'll allow me to return to my original question just yeah, for a second, yeah. do you feel like there should be some principled standard that we should adopt of report how you report and select your samples? And can you imagine what that standard would be? Like if you're gonna make 10 samples, you have to report everything, all of them. Can you imagine some standard like that or what would? I mean, I would kind of hope that if you said, you know, I, I grew something and it's superconducted, you would at least want to mention just, you know, how many samples it took to get this thing to work. Um, you know, sometimes experiments fail for much more mundane reasons, but you'd kind of want to, you know, certainly I make my students not give us, you know, a zoomed in view of an interface. They have to show, you know, in the supplementary, at least a 10 micron field of view. But, um, you know, you would hope that with growers, you would have some obligation as to, you know, how many, you know, data points of what worked, what didn't work, because half of that's trying to get your phase space figured out. Um, you know, one thing that's been very helpful has been when people put their raw data plus the code that produces the raw data up as the data for the paper. I feel like something like that ought to be required if you want to, if you want to publish, right? That it's sure your figure looks great, but show me the raw data that came off the instrument, hopefully in the raw data file that can't be manipulated and show me the code that got you the figure. And at least if I've got those two things, you can go back and you can check for, you know, is the result that they produced just Fourier filtered noise because they were too stupid to understand how to control the bandwidth on a Fourier filter. And I can point to a paper up on archive right now that's going to become some excited twisted bilayer ferroelectric and it's just Fourier filter junk. Um, but, you know, I feel like our field was much worse off 20 years ago when no one was had a capability of posting data. Now, at least the reputable groups will post data and codes and the groups that refuse to do so, you can at least get a sense maybe something sketchy is going on with them. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, I wanna go next to uh, Eugenie Reich, because you get a very different perspective, I think sometimes from the consequences of, or who who pays for when there's unreliable or, or even fraudulent results. So I wonder, who do, you, who do you see being most negative? Like we're sort of taking the scientist's perspective, but who do you see being most negatively impacted when there's unreliable or fraudulent results that proliferate in the literature? And what do you see as the most effective system for, for guarding against those consequences? Okay. Um, yeah, so as you said, I'm best known in this community for writing a 2009 book about Hendrik Schrein's case of fraud. Um, and of relevance to this workshop, there's a chapter in my book talking about um, the experiences of I guess about a dozen labs or so that tried to replicate the work. Um, mostly that wasn't their, their ultimate objective just to vindicate Shun, but rather they wanted to get a working setup so they could do their own experiments, but they already could not um, get, get his setup working. And so I was speaking to graduate students, assistant professors, untenured, mostly untenured assistant professors, some, some more experienced professors and postdocs 
who was spending significant chunks of time. I say significant, but Shan, Shan's case of fraud was reasonably constrained compared to some of what's been talked about or that exists um, in that he, it took two years to publish 15 papers in Nature and Science and then bust. So that's about two years that people are trying to build on work that is completely made up. Um, you know, a lot of people I see even in the chat are saying, well, this is egregious, this is a one-off. So let me just talk about what I think is maybe relevant to other scenarios out of the experiences of, of the people trying to replicate the work. Um, and, I, and I think when Simone spoke at the beginning, um, she, was, she was right that a lot of it is not just, the, not just the bad paper, the unreproducible paper in nature or science, but the um, informal, I guess she called it social process or something, but the informal interactions around the paper. So in Shan's case, a lot of one-to-one -one interactions between Shan and people at his career level or a little below or a little above trying to build on the work. A lot of misleading personal conversations, emails in which he first says one thing, go look at this parameter space. And then a few months later when they've tried that, go look somewhere else. Um, this is actively misleading people and confusing and obfuscating in real time. Um, a lot of, um, um, uh, and, and the same at sort of talks by his uh, collaborator backlog, a, a lot of sort of misleading, whether on, informa on information from Chern, largely about how the experiments were done. Um, so it's not just the, it's not just the publication, it's what goes around it. And so, you know, a lot of people here spoke about negative behaviors like not sharing data, not letting samples be characterized other ways or cherry picking. Um, but on the, I, so I wanted to talk a bit about why it gets, why believe, why people believe any claim where that's happening to begin with. And so what happened with Shan is a certain myth grew up very quickly that he has magical hands, that he's got supremely um, produced crystals grown at Bell Labs, an elite institution, and no wonder my lab can't compete or no wonder I can't compete. And, um, you know, this is a top institution. Batlog is a very famous guy who almost got the Nobel Prize before. And it's quite plausible might get it might be part of something that would get it now. Um, it, and it's uh, a certain amount of myth making around that. So um, this is what's going on 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 one side when the lack of transparency and data sharing and data access is going on on the other side. And it's the combination of, of both together, which proved very problematic. And then, you know, in those days, I don't remember people talking about phrases like, um, that Simon used like status bias or putting it in that framing. But, but that is an element where, you know, if you were at some significantly less famous uh, institution than Bell Labs, um, and you started saying this kind of thing, it, it, you probably wouldn't get nearly as far um, before people stop, stopped, um, you know, stopped working on it and trying to build on it. So I think that's where those things intersect. Um, so the experience that then you were asking who the victims are, people suffering from gaps on their resume, waste of their lab resources, funding agencies, wasting money, funding the labs to do that work, based on false information. Uh, that's the kind of trail of, of victim, you know, that, that's where people are suffering, I think. And, and competitors who, as some people here have been saying, can't publish a less groundbreaking result because they're taking the time to do the work properly. Um, and, and that's a type of victim too. Um, and then I think you had a second part to your question, which is, you know, something oh, like who's responsible or how to prevent. Oh, well, what, what strategies do you see for mitigating against people being actively misleading? Like, 
It's a difficult question. I'm sorry. And you probably can come at it from a different perspective than some of us who are in sort of yeah. entrenched inside this business. Yeah. So after I, after I published my book on the, I'll answer that by what I did. After I published my book on the Shan case, I spent a few years publishing different reports and in, in sometimes investigations, scientific breakthroughs or, or, um, or problems with scientific claims. And I eventually started finding, and this was when, you know, social media was rising, um, that I, I think it was getting, so, so some of these situations were always covered up, right? But at least when they did come out in the public, there would be some satisfaction immediately in the Shine case within two years, it, 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 it's a whistle was blown, uh, the duplicate curves were in the New York Times, from then until the committee that Don Monroe was on publishing its report, thanks to what Bell Labs did, just a few months to reach an incredibly impressive public report by the institution. Um, I can't think of, in, in 20 years, I can't think of anything comparable to that, which has to be somewhat shameful, particularly when you consider that was private money, and you guys are sitting at institutions taking a lot of public money and taxpayers' money and not getting satisfaction in terms of public reports coming out on what's what's really going on. So um, in terms of, you know, I, I did end up going to law school, getting my law license. I, I've been involved in a couple of scientific fraud investigations, one in particular inside the um, government where we were investig where we were investigating a scientific fraud case in stem cell research and some of the same factors existed it I can talk about it because it's closed case and because some facts were even in the New York Times but uh, this was a lab where they would they were putting up the virtuoso defense as it's called somebody asked at a conference why can't I replicate this research and the answer came back because you are not a virtuoso, meaning you're not an operatic star, right? You're not a talent. You're not a magical hands person or a superb crystals or an elite institution. This was Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a Harvard teaching hospital. No wonder you can't do it. Um, and that turned out to be not just some fabricated data for sure that at the center of it, but also protocols known not to work that they keep reporting, keep using, putting all the research through one bottleneck in the lab that is a guy that's been there forever and no one quite understands how the information that comes into that person turns into the paper um, and maintaining that even when questions about replicability are coming in from outside. So, you know, I think that institutions uh, control the salaries they're providing infrastructure where data is saved or should be saved. Um, they ultimately have the ability to either have, document the data and have the data shared and available, um, you know, to go in and make someone work with someone else. I, I think that I think that when people get super frustrated, like at Bell Labs, it's because they want their institution to. They believe in their institution and they know it has the capability to check this stuff and the checks there weren't happening um and it, 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 the same is true at other institutions i understand it's all organized by pi group and there's there's reasons that that, that funding agencies are doing that um but institutions then who are who are hosting all these pi groups if they are then like oh no, sorry, we, we can't share our data, or we don't keep track of data. Um, somebody comes from the outside and asks for data, or so another group in the same place asks for data and it's not available. And instead there's press releases going out and there's myth-making about what a great institution we are and how it's not surprising that really that our people are doing so much better than everyone else. Um, so that's how I got it. Now I'm a whistleblower lawyer, and that's why you know I end up uh, suing or contemplating suing some of these entities because it you know an institution just like a corporation. I've been involved in pharmaceutical litigation, so it you know they ultimately taking some public money and 
doing something problematic. That's only for egregious, egregious cases, I hasten to say. And I know that lawyers are usually very persona non grata in the scientific community. That's for good reasons too. Um, but I'd say most lawyers are working on for the institutions, for the journals, for targets, subjects of misconduct, and they are trying to slow stuff down, keep stuff secret, um, issue libel threat, threats and fraud threats. And, you know, that's a whole pattern of activity. And many lawyers doing that are vastly better trained and, and more expert than, than I am in misconduct. Um, and, be and far better paid and better financed. Um, so, you know, this is, this is where the legal brain power is. And, and you're not going to see any lawyers like that, you know, and I might be wrong, please speak up if you're here, but joining this meeting and even talking about that, that type of work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your perspective. <laughs> and I'm sure that a very large fraction of this audience has read your book. I found it very inspiring in a certain odd way. Okay, I want to get to Jessica Thomas. Sorry, I should have said I'm just doing these in alphabetical order, so you shouldn't take anything from the order here. Um, you are maybe in the uncomfortable position that there's a, a lot of us find it very easy to just blame the journals, like, you know, oh, the journals are creating bad incentives and that's creating bad behavior. So I think it's very important that we hear from someone who's actually working within sort of the, the journal system. So a question that I'm particularly interested to hear you comment on is, you know, there's sort of this bias that some of us are, are railing against that it's harder to publish a refutation of an incorrect claim at the same level of vis visibility at the original claim. Do you feel like that's a fair criticism? And if so, what can be done to increase the visibility of work that's refuting unreliable claims? Okay, um, yeah, so definitely I'm in the hot seat, um, but that's okay. <laughs> so I'm, I wanna learn from this group too. Um, I mean, I think most editors of journals would, would, would feel comfortable saying that if a result was a big deal, a new result was a big deal, then um, refuting it or the, the fact that it's not correct would also be a big deal. I think that would be the spirit in which they approach it. Um, I sort of took at face value the, the statement that it's harder to refute a result than it, it should be. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to like kind of get into that, into some data around that, like how long is it really taking to really learn from that? Um, but I think one of the one of the reasons that it it seems to take a really long time um, from the standpoint of somebody who's trying to to refute a result, and I, I think here we might might be talking about um, trying to refute a result that you think might be fraudulent or where there there was cherry picking of the data um, more so than we're talking about like reporting a null result. Um, I think part of what it is is that when you feel like you're fighting for a truth. Right. Any delay seems like an incredible delay. So I think that would be part of it. Um, from the standpoint of an editor, I think one of the things that makes this longer is that you're not dealing with the, the usual beast of peer review where authors are coming in. They have a result to report. They're going in front of experts and they're getting at it. You know, there's just kind of like a well oiled um, kind of process and seasoning around how that peer review works. But when it comes to refuting something, you've got a completely different situation, right? That tends to be rare and you may not have seen as often and every case is somewhat different. But you're- uh, Sorry, I think the intent of the question is like, even, uh, even putting aside the issue of trying to get someone's paper retracted or putting a comment on a paper, say someone you know, publishes a paper in PRL or something that has some exciting result. And then another group comes along and said, we did exactly the same thing as that other group and we didn't get the same result. So we did as best one could possibly do to try to get that same exciting result. And what we find is that it doesn't seem to exist. And I think a complaint is that it's very hard to publish that negative result, which would seem like evidence to the contrary of what the original group was claiming, separate from accusations of bad behavior. Okay, all right, so that, that, that helps. Um, so I think part of it is that when, and this is comes back to the sociology of science, I, I think, right? When you have a new result, right? Something that no one has ever seen before, there's just kind of an, an intrinsic, I think, acceptance, right? Or we want to believe that you've discovered something, right? That's how, that's how science seems to move forward. 
And all you're fighting against is um, sort of the knowledge that, okay, nobody had seen this before, so you probably looked in the right place. But when you have a null result, um, there's, I think it's more complicated, right? Because you, now it's just two things up against each other, the person who tried to repeat the measurement and the person who actually got it. So it's like, you're having to one person has to be right and the other person wrong so i think it just adds to the co the complexity of trying to determine which one is like of equal importance um i think you asked the another part which is how do we make how do we make null results or um more visible i mean and, and when you had posed this question i was thinking more of things like retractions but I think what I'm about to say would apply even to, to a null result. I think we don't talk about those stories very much. We don't write about them very much. Um, and, and again, it's because we think, okay, well, maybe that's boring, right? It's not something new. But I think if we could make more of a narrative around what goes into actually proving something wrong, that there's a story there too in actually how difficult it is to take something that's been discovered and then to think of a way that you need to maybe extend the analysis or do the experiment in a more thorough way. If we could find more of the narrative around that, I think people would start to, to talk about it more. And as journals, we could, we could think of ways to, to bring that forward more. Can, can, sorry, can yeah, I, I think this is a good point to allow the panelists to ask questions to each other, and then I'll start taking questions from the audience. Can, I just wanted to say something right in response to what Jessica just said, which is just um, generally when I was working as a science reporter, I would, reporting in the scientific community, people would put emphasis in their interviews on being the first to discover something or having invented something, uh, having realized something before other people. Even when I started reporting the Schoen book, uh, some people like to say they realized it was fraud before other people. Um, I, I myself framed it that way. I spent a lot of time asking people, when did you first realize or who do you think the first person was you realized? But when I got to this chapter about people trying to reproduce, um, you know, I realized this framing was wrong. There was nobody saying I was the first person to fail to reproduce trans results, right? oh, within a week of his laser being in nature, I had already failed to reproduce it. That's not that's not the way it really works. If you want to close the book on a claim as opposed to open open the discussion, um, people, there's no real ego in these groups, or there isn't room for ego in the same way. And there isn't room really for press releases about, you know, we tried really hard and discovered you know that something is hopeless um so that that's my thought about what you were saying and i don't have a solution and i'm not a journal editor you are so i guess the journals maybe will come up with some way to write about this or 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 frame it or make it interesting so i think that that's exactly what i what i'm getting at is that there has to be some way of celebrating the hard work that goes into um, figuring out where the problem was. I mean, you're right, that would require more work, more work from editors and more sort of sleuthing. But certainly the stories that we've heard earlier today, they're fascinating, right? Just the process of trying to figure out what went wrong. Now, of course, those are more, that's why I make a distinction between like uh, refute, refuting something because there was fraud and refuting something because you tried the experiment again and it didn't work and i think that's it's true that the the first kind tends to get the more um i guess high profile story because there's more of the human drama in it but i think if we could look for ways to find a fascinating scientific um story the detective story of figuring out that hey this this experiment needed to be done in this way to 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 refute that earlier claim. I think that's where you would get you could start to bring more attention to this really hard work that goes into continuing the science process and figuring out what went wrong in the first place. That's not how you get funding. That's the problem. You don't get funding by showing somebody else is wrong. You get funding by claiming yourself that you have something new and the first in the world and everything. 
And so we don't really have time to do all this, this follow-up work. We're doing it. But I, yeah. I think, you know, if I look at the shown stuff, I think a lot, a lot of people weren't trying to reproduce shown's result. They, the natural thing is to assume he got it right. And then you want to build on it, right? And you can get funding for building on the result. But the first part of the building on that result is you've kind of got to do what he did and then a little bit more. And then, you know, you got funding for doing the little bit more thing. And then you suddenly find out it just didn't work. Um, and that's sort of at the point that you realize something went wrong. Um, and I, you know, at that point, which is usually, you know, a year or two later after the actual publication, that's about when you're ready to maybe make some definitive comment, which is often, unfortunately, outside the time window for some of the high profile journals to actually write a comment. But it would be really great if there was a mechanism, you know, sort of like, I think, pub peer, but, you know, attached to the journal so that you didn't miss it that people could comment and say, hey, you know, we're trying to do this and we're stuck. That that might not be the end of the thing, but at least it's an early warning sign that maybe there's a problem. That's an interesting suggestion. Uh, and of course, that opens another psychological can of worm. If uh, I'm a famous scientist, uh, influential, say at Harvard or Princeton, and you are uh, assistant professor in some mediocre college, how likely you would be to make me uh, your enemy by sort of attacking you unofficially? Publishing a paper which came to referee and so on, that's a bit different. But just a blog, uh, you know, we're getting too close to like internet flame wars <laughs> this way. And also, there is no protection from, unfortunately, there is a number of uh, crackpots around as well. Um, but I'd like to ask a question to our um, editorial community, so to speak, Jacek and other editors present here. What do you think about the proposal that I sounded here and he received several um, positive uh, raised um, thumbs about making that uh, um, stated principle that a paper which can pass the referee process and disprove or debunk a claim that was published in your journal? automatically passes the master of being sufficiently important for publication. So if this is say Nature Communications published a paper, I can prove that this paper was wrong or even manipulated. I submit that claim, it goes to the referee. If it's referee decides that I'm right, that's, uh, there's no burden of, pro of proof on my side to, to um, prove that this paper is sufficiently important and interesting. What do you think about this principle to be uh, explicitly stated and implemented? I don't know if that question was directed at B. There is another editor in this chat who might want to speak up. But well, there's more than one. I think there's, yeah, there's Ed there and there are a couple of other people. Yeah, if there's anyone else who's an editor and would like to reply, raise your hand and I'll unmute you after Jessica's done. Uh, one thing I was going to say is that I think one of the issues is that it's it's often not very clean. The re when when a result comes in and it refutes the first thing, what what may often happen is chipping away at a result for with many different groups or maybe one group trying many many things, and I think that can that can often get in the way of of sort of the simplicity of just saying that's wrong, right? Because a, a signal is very clean, right? A new signal that no one's ever seen, and so that gets published, but the non-signal tends to not be as clean, well, not as I obvious. Think, I think that the matter for referees, just the same way as referees decide on the original paper, the referee should decide whether counterclaim is sufficiently demonstrated. If they disagree and say that's questionable, that's a different story. But if they do agree, then the question is whether this uh, negative result is sufficiently important. If the original paper was published in PRL, would you think that the paper which just proved and the referee agreed that the original paper was wrong can be published in PRL as well? Or it's just not that interesting. Okay, fine, that's not there. So I think it could be very I could be I think it could be as interesting. I could get in trouble for saying that, but I would think often it would be as interesting if it's really clean and obvious. But I think the other editors should speak up too. <laughs> Okay, let me uh, let me pass the microphone here to Jan Komilev, who's a, a editor at Fiscal Review B. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, 
Well, I, I've been for 13 years with PRL, so uh, I have some experience, 20 years in total. The point is here, Igor, you know better than to ask this question to editors from, from Physical Review. You, you know, actually, that we pay much more attention to such uh, cases, difficult cases, than to any other case. And you're asking it rhetorically, but uh, if we dig into our database, which we won't do right now, since we always think about things and we, we look what we're doing very carefully, uh, there will be cases where actually we acted precisely in the way you want us to. And uh, like you say, uh, you kind of slip the word immediately when it almost seemed like, oh, anyone sends us something and we immediately are critical and we immediately publish it. But, but then I understand you actually mean it has to, to pass must, the master peer review. And again, I'm telling you such papers uh, are really very carefully considered. I'm speaking here, not off the top of my head, uh, we changed here anyway, but <laughs> out of my 20 years experience. So uh, do I want to, to, to paint us as innocent? No, because the question is not if we are innocent, we are into the business of publishing. And so I can only tell you that we are doing things much more carefully than what you seem or, or the people participating in this, this um, well, uh, are saying. So, okay, I guess Stephen has to say something. He's yeah. the peer uh, leader. Just one word, Yonko. I think that PRB is actually uh, the, least, uh, um, the least culpable uh, journal, but it also it's not necessarily because you guys are great, you are great anyway, but also because the problem getting exponentially uh, and increasingly more severe when the reputation, the impact factor selectivity of journal increases. So as good as PSRFB is, it's not uh, PRL or PRX, definitely not nature or science. There the problem becomes much more important. I, okay, so, sorry, just very so, briefly, sorry, I promised I... that I would stop this recording at three. So as okay. soon as I'm going to let Stephen Nagler talk briefly, okay. and then I'll let Eugenie Reich, and then I'm going to stop the recording and the discussion can continue. So I'm I'm a new editor without that much experience in it. Uh, so take these with a grain of salt. But Igor, I definitely agree that these papers should be published. But I don't know that the problem is exactly with editors as much as it is with the community. And I will relay a specific experience that happened to me many years ago. Somebody published a paper in PRL, which made a claim that seemed a bit dubious to us on a certain material. And we had uh, obtained experimental evidence that showed the claim had to be incorrect. Uh, the reviewer came back and wrote a re review that said, obviously, this paper is right. The original PRL was clearly wrong. However, uh, that paper was obviously wrong, and there's no justification for publishing a PRL on this paper, which was clearly right from the beginning. And uh, the paper was published, I think, uh, in PRB, which was fine. The data got out there. But after it was published, we noted that that incorrect PRL was still cited several times. Right? But this is, this is a matter of, um, you know, somehow the referees, the community has to step up and sort of accept that these papers should be published maybe in the same journal. Yeah, absolutely. This is okay. perhaps a bit a different issue. I mean, a journal like this where we get so many submissions that it's very hard to make sure they all get the proper referees. Mm -hmm. It's I've a problem, really, yeah. You know, I, I, th I think Steve has an excellent point, and that's my experience as well, that I had referees in similar situations, which were clearly competent, and uh, analyzed and dissected my um, rebuttal paper and say, yes, you are right, the original paper was wrong, but that's not the reason to publish it in this high-profile journal. I think that's the point where the editor should step in. They got the information they needed, that the counterclaim is correct and the paper was debunked. Then they make decision regardless of what the referee said after that. Okay, I'm going to let Eugenie Reich speak and then I'm going to stop the recording. Go ahead, Eugenie. It's okay. My thought went away. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. The recording is now stopping. <laughs>